This is Walter Bosley, and this is the Walter Bosley Channel. And I'm going to be doing a little series of discussions, uh, specifically discussing my book, Secret Missions to the Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton. Now what I'll do is uh, read the book, sections of it, and give you my thoughts, um, both my thoughts at the time I was working on the book and uh, my present opinions. I wrote and released this book in 2015, and essentially, before we jump into it, here's what I think. Now, the background is that Sir Richard Francis Burton was assigned as a consul in South America, Brazil specifically, for a, f a few years um, in the late 1860s, and he spent much of his time uh, doing personal research. And at the end of that particular assignment, he packed up the belongings, sent his wife back home to England, and he stayed in South America, during which time there remains a big missing period of time in Burton's life. Now, Sir Richard Francis Burton was a man who documented every little thing he did ad nauseum, but he rides off out of Argentina, Buenos Aires specifically, heads west into the wilderness and uh, isn't seen again until, well, five, roughly five months later in Peru, Lima, Peru. And he's in a tavern having a few, if you know what I mean. He never left any writings that anyone has ever seen yet publicly um, about exactly where he was and what he was doing while in South America. And as you will see, if you continue to listen to you know, this, this little series on Burton that I'm going to be reading and discussing, um, there's much reason to suspect that he was looking for the very same lost city or lost civilization that uh, Colonel Percy Fawcett would famously in the following century uh, disappear in his search for um, he and his son Jack would never return from the final foray into the Amazon forest looking for the lost city of Z and in my research on Burton, um, what I found was strong evidence that Burton was looking for the same lost city of Z. Um, here's what I think. I think Burton found it. I think Burton found a city of that civilization that Fawcett was looking for. And it all relates to the mysterious manuscript 512, which, by the way, we learn that Percy Fawcett was also guided by. So, I'm going to jump in. As I said, this is from my book, The Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, by Walter Bosley, who is myself. Just in case, you know, any... Um, issue arises on the platform here as to whose IP this is. It's mine. <laughs> anyway, let's, let's jump in. What I'll do is read the prologue. Now, real quick before I, quickly, before I get started, I'm not an apologist for anything, okay? Um, I don't adjust my ingestion or serving up 
of history and historical research for um, the hypersensitive, okay? Um, if you're not into adventurous manly tales of, you know, adventurous manly adventurers and explorers, then this just isn't going to be of interest to you. But um, I think most of you will find this very interesting. Many of you listening to this have probably read this book, and at least you've heard me talk about it, but there are several new people here at the channel, and you might not be familiar with my research on Burton, so here we go. Prologue. It was March of 1869 when a gaunt and haggard man of middle age sat in a cafe in Lima. He was drinking alone. His tattered coat looked as worn by the field as he did. The gaze in his tired eyes crossed a thousand or more inward miles. He appeared completely oblivious to his surroundings, a nondescript establishment somewhere in the city where the Spanish conquest took root in Peru three centuries prior. This man had been in the city for several days and had apparently accomplished little more than a drinking binge beyond his own past exploits. He was spent, body and soul. Never had he been so thoroughly exhausted. It was as if Lima, Peru were the dullest spot in the world. He had never been to a place where he could not find something to entertain his ever-curious mind. What was wrong with him? It would be useless to describe the scene around the man at the small table because he seemed to notice nothing except the bottle and whatever seemed to haunt him. He seemed to wake from a dream when an unidentified face paused to congratulate him. Captain Burton, good luck on your post in Damascus. The man called Burton said nothing. History tells us. He simply stared. It seemed to come back to him, the world he had known before. In spite of what he had seen and experienced in the most dangerous jungle on the planet, in spite of his much-noticed transformation, Richard Francis Burton felt the world around him take shape again in a whirl of sound and color and light. After all that this strange and haunted land had shown him, he was simply going on to the next assignment. What you are about to embark upon is the speculation. In spite of all the recorded history about the life of Sir Richard Francis Burton, in spite of the volumes he produced during that lifetime of travel and exploration, science and sin, there remains a blank period about which not a word has ever been produced from his papers or books or any other source. To comprehend the astonishing curiosity of that seemingly small fact, consider how much Burton had written about every other place to which he had traveled, and the things he did and saw. Almost fifty books, over twenty pamphlets, and more than two hundred other articles and reports. Burton even wrote a book about mostly his time in Utah, which his critics considered beyond even his usual love of detail. Burton was indeed a prolific writer of his geographic, archaeological, and anthropological exploits. He was a scientist who sought to expand human knowledge. Scientists publish their findings, they share their data, and Burton certainly did that. But Richard Francis Burton was more than a mere scientific technician. He was an officer in the legendary East India Company. He was a linguist extraordinaire. He was a spy one of the greatest in the history of the profession for his ability to disguise himself and penetrate otherwise forbidden territory. Where other men, most men to be honest, were not suited to the field, Burton excelled in frontiers and in the wilds. He drank hard, tasted the female delights of every land he explored, and once took a spear through his face while fighting natives in Somaliland and lived to show off the scar. And most of all, he wrote about it. And that is the problem. Richard Francis Burton wrote profusely about everything he did, except two times, both in the Americas. The first instance was a conspicuous period of several weeks that he spent in the southern United States late in the year 1860, when war was looming. 
Burton, a British intelligence agent in Dixie just months before the civil, U.S. Civil War, a war in which some wealthy aristocrats in England aided the Confederacy, suggests the obvious. The second and most curious blank space in his life is why this book was written. In the late 1860s, Richard Francis Burton was assigned as British consul to Brazil. He and his wife Isabel thrived there in spite of the bouts of illness and the rigors of a tropical environment. Burton wrote works about the local wars and he wrote books of cultural interest. His time there documented just as all his travels and scientific work in the years prior to and after Brazil had been, except the period late in his South American assignment. The most conspicuous hole in Burton's life is a period of six months which he spent exploring the wilderness of South America and practically nothing is written or even known about it. Nothing known of the numerous weeks he spent in the jungles and the high plains, in the two vast regions teeming with the sort of adventure that Burton lived for and always wrote about. This missing period in itself is a mysterious adventure begging to be explored. When he emerged in Lima, tattered and haggard, we are told Burton went on the drinking binge of his life. A man who had drank since youth, and was known to hold his liquor like a champ, and who had seen up close all the ways the jungles and other wilds of the world could kill. This legendary man, not yet 48 years old, appears in Peru and spends weeks in cafes and bars, silent and visibly worn down, drinking every day. No one who knew him personally had heard from him for months. No one to this day knows exactly where he was or what he was doing during most of that time, save a vague episode in which he claimed to have spent Christmas fleeing from natives, four of whom he had to kill to save his own life. All we do know is what he later told and what few could corroborate. This misty period concludes with Burton silent and stunned, drunk in a cafe in Peru. What had happened? I will propose what I suggest is the best possible answer to that particular question. Within the context of the place in the man's life, that Richard Francis Burton emerges in such a state after exploring the most fascinating place in the Western Hemisphere is curious indeed. I have an idea about what he was doing and I have the evidence that there is something to my speculation. But before we go further, you need to know the context in which this mystery of Burton in South America becomes so enticing. Why is it interesting? It was all about the secrets of human history and why Sir Richard Francis Burton disappeared for several months into the land of mystery. By the time Burton came on the scene, the search for a lost civilization had been going on for centuries. The British involvement in that search dates back to before the Elizabethan period, during which that search started to become somewhat institutional. We will examine that in this book. The idea that there existed one or more advanced civilizations in the remote past has been of keen interest to highly intelligent men for a very long time. What exactly do we mean by an advanced civilization? megalithic structures built upon a so-called world energy grid, advanced languages lost to present-day understanding, a sophisticated grasp of astronomy and physics for its time, descriptions of flying machines and terrible weaponry, even medical technology and artificial light, things that should not have existed so long ago according to consensus academia. Yet, the inconvenient evidence persists these things fascinated some of the greatest minds Britain ever produced. John Anthony West argues that clues to this lost civilization are to be found in ancient Egypt. And I'm quoting, Egyptian science, medicine, mathematics, and astronomy were all of an exponentially higher order of refinement and sophistication than modern scholars will acknowledge. The whole of Egyptian civilization was based upon a complete and precise understanding of universal laws, and this profound understanding manifested itself in a consistent, coherent, and interrelated system that fused science, art, and religion into a single organic unity. Every aspect of Egyptian knowledge seems to have been complete at the very beginning, 
Everything is right there at the start. The answer to the mystery is, of course, obvious. Egyptian civilization was not a development, but a legacy. End quote. The evidence for a lost technology dates back even farther in Vedic tradition. Ancient technology researcher Bill Clendenin wrote, quoting, From the ancient Vimanaka Shastra, I gained useful information concerning Vimanas or aircraft. Also, in the Samlangana Sutradhara, it is written that the Vimanas were made of light material with a strong bell-shaped body. Iron, copper, and lead were used in their construction. They could fly great distances. They had fire and mercury at the bottom. End quote. Clendenin continues with a quote from the 1908 translation of the ancient Vimanaka Shastra by G. R. Joyser, the founder and director of the International Academy of Sanskrit Research, and I'm quoting, Strong and durable must the body be made, like a great flying bird of light material. Inside it one must place the mercury engine with its iron heating apparatus beneath by means of the power latent in the mercury which sets the driving whirlwind in motion a man sitting inside may travel a great distance in the sky in a most marvelous manner End quote. this is very interesting coming from an ancient text that we have reason to suspect predates ancient egypt by thousands of years what it describes should be rather familiar to some readers but we'll get to that soon enough let's continue with more of the translation by joyser Quoting, Four strong mercury containers must be built into the interior structure. When these have been heated by controlled fire from iron containers, the Vimana develops thunder power through the mercury, and at once it becomes like a pearl in the sky. End quote. Clendenin adds that the Samrangana Sutradhara translation says, quoting, By means of these machines, human beings can fly in the air, and heavenly beings can come down to earth. End quote. Ancient flying machines are admittedly a rather spectacular and controversial example. There are more down-to-earth clues of advanced knowledge. In ancient Egypt, French chemists were reportedly stunned to discover. Let me, let me start that over again. In the ruins of ancient Egypt... <laughs> French chemists were reportedly stunned to discover that exceptionally preserved cosmetic powders dating back to 2000 BC consisted of chemical compounds extremely rare in nature. Made of laurianite and phosgenite, they were determined to be of artificial production. In 1961, a French magazine, Revue d'Aluminum, issue number 283, published photos of belt buckles that were reportedly found by Chinese archaeologists in 1959. The Chinese claimed these buckles were several thousands of years old and made of aluminum. The problem is that the known process for extracting aluminum from bosite wasn't perfected until 1886 AD. For several years now, Many researchers and authors have presented works on the anomalies of the ancient world to argue that history may not be what we are traditionally taught based upon academic interpretation. For probably the most comprehensive argument in a single source, I refer you to the ample tome Forbidden Archaeology, or even its shorter companion, The Hidden History of the Human Race, both by Michael L. Cremo and Richard L. Thompson. These books present, in all their extremely inconvenient detail, the finding of objects that should not be, according to professional scientific and academic dogma. These books will put lead in the pencils of all enthusiasts of lost technology. Resulting from his extensive studies of ancient pyramid structures throughout the world, Joseph P. Farrell concludes the following, and I quote, there are three overall levels of construction evident throughout the world in conjunction with constructed structures on the world grid, and paradoxically, the older the structures, the higher the technological skill and scientific knowledge encoded in them. Yet the placement of such sites as Tikal and Teotihuacan on a grid system that evidently placed the prime meridian through the Great Pyramid's apex indicates that 
some consistent body of knowledge survived into the later periods of construction, and that this knowledge may have been the proprietary intellectual culture of a hidden elite or elites constructing them. End quote. Farrell further emphasizes the following point, quoting, The consistency of the building and placement of objects on the world grid system, plus the consistency of the mythological leitmotifs over time and area, also suggests that a detailed plan was in place that arose from that common proprietary intellectual culture of the elite. End quote. What does this mean? Let Farrell state it one more time, quoting, the high level of scientific knowledge represented by such sites as Giza or Nabta Playa, or for that matter, Teotihuacan, indicate a degree of scientific knowledge that could only have come down from high antiquity, from a civilization and scientific culture equally, if not more, sophisticated as our own. End quote. Readers of my previous works, Empire of the Wheel 2, Friends from Sonora, and Secret Missions, The Hidden Legacy of Old California, will already know my position on the idea that a technologically advanced civilization existed on this planet ages ago. I accept it. For me, the evidence is convincing. However, neither I nor Joseph P. Farrell may be credible enough for everyone. Was there anyone else of historical note with accepted credentials as a scientific thinker who even suspected this idea was valid? I might point to Thomas Jefferson, who, resulting from his investigation into the curious mystery of weights and measures of medieval Britain, wrote the following, and I quote, But a triple set of exact proportional representing weights, measures, and the things to be weighed and measured, and a relation so integral between weights and solid measures, must have been the result of design and scientific calculation, and not a mere coincidence of hazard. But the harmony here developed in the system of weights and measures, corroborated by a general use from very high antiquity of that or of a nearly similar weight under another name, seem stronger proofs that this is legal weight. End quote. What Jefferson is saying is that the system of weights and measures that he deduced was handed down from a far remote past technology proved in his assessment to be so accurate as to continue to be set as the official standard because of its technical sophistication. This is essentially an admission from one of the greatest minds of the 18th century, who lived into the 19th century, that he suspected a technologically advanced civilization had once existed on this planet. The subject of weights and measures is ripe with the evidentiary fruit of a lost technology of very high antiquity being passed down through the ages to our times. In their investigation into the curious congruence between ancient Minoan, Greek, and Sumerian weights and measures, authors Alan Butler and Christopher Knight made a startling discovery when comparing megalithic spheres to the modern metric system. Though there was some equality between the two, Butler and Knight were astonished to find that there were nearly identical volumes between ancient spheres of 5, 10, and 20 megalithic inches and our pint, gallon, and bushel. The fit, they reported, is 99% accurate. Butler and Knight observed that volumes measured in the megalithic inch showed congruency with both the modern imperial and metric systems. There had to be a link between remote antiquity and the British system, and they identified it in the Sumerian double cush of over 99 centimeters long, which happened to equal a timekeeping pendulum swing of one second. All of this congruency between megalithic and British imperial weights and measures was interpreted by Butler and Knight to be evidence of a remote attempt to jumpstart civilization, according to Joseph Farrell. What is evident to me is the passing of privileged scientific knowledge down through the ages from the mysterious megalithic culture on to the ancient British. This brings us closer to the premise of this book, though first we must provide a little more background. The British Connection 
So now we come to why English thinkers would be so interested in a lost civilization of a very high antiquity. The British Isles are full of some of the best evidence in the world that such a civilization existed, the curious facts of measures and weights included. Much has been written and said about Stonehenge, so I'll just recognize its obvious megalithic handprint and move on. There are, in fact, so many megalithic sites in the British Isles that appear to have been engineered for astronomical purposes that many researchers suggest they may have been part of a network. Scara Bray is one example of a site that had no other apparent use than scientific, according to the scientists who studied it. Discovered in 1850 on the western Atlantic coast of the Scottish Isle of Orkney, this ancient village was abandoned circa 2655 B.C. A collection of stone buildings suited for residence included locking doors, cooking facilities, advanced sewage and plumbing, and furniture of hewn stone. There were cupboards and hidden spaces for secret storage. Some of the most telling data about the inhabitants of this strange complex was discovered in their refuse in which remains of their food was accumulated. Whoever they were, the people of Scara Bray ate sheep, cattle, and the occasional pork along with fish and oysters. What is odd is that archaeologists found carcass bones without skulls to go with them, leading to the conclusion that pre-butchered game had been brought to the site. Just as strange is that there was not much, if any, source of fuel for fires, and yet their food was cooked, and the structures were heated by warming the stone walls of the buildings. These mystery people lived on a nearly barren island, yet had plenty of meat and some manner of fuel. The builders of Scara Bray had been identified with the grooved Ware people whom Christopher Knight and Robert Lomas link to world-traveling Sumerians who brought civilization to less developed cultures. They argue that because the grooved Ware people sites are located where there are observable astronomical activities, this is what Scara's Bray, Scara Bray's main purpose must have been. It is a compelling argument for advanced technological knowledge in remote antiquity. Another compelling example of megalithic technology in the British Isles is Newgrange, linked to Tara and the lore of the mysterious Tuatha de Danann, also known as the Lords of Light. I have discussed the Tuatha relative to lost technology in Empire of the Wheel Three, The Nameless Ones specifically relative to a round stone tower in Riverside, California, which I also point out is a strong British immigrant community in its history. The Tuatha are associated with legends of people from other worlds, a theme usually linked to those who bring advanced technologies to lesser developed cultures. Newgrange is described by Knight and Lomas as not so much a mound as it is a series of parabolic sections. Its most startling feature, the exterior wall of white quartz crystal that shines brilliantly in the sunlight. Built almost a millennia before the pyramids of Egypt, according to mainstream archaeology, mind you, Newgrange's construction incorporates almost 300,000 tons of stones. One feature of the site is a trio of chambers at the end of an almost 60-foot passageway through which, at the right times, the light of Venus beams to the back wall of the central chamber. This is the clue to its possible link to a lost civilization. Knight and Lomas explore the possibility that because of the beam of Venus shining through the long passageway to the trio of chambers at the opposite end, and various symbols at the site, especially a triple spiral calculable to the human gestation period, this particular feature may have been a birthing chamber. They even suggest it was a birthing chamber associated with the legendary Watchers of the Book of Enoch. Before you dismiss that suggestion, consider the quote the authors reprint in their book. And I'm quoting, And I went in till I drew night to a wall which is built of crystals and surrounded by tongues of fire, and it began to affright me. And I went into the tongues of fire and drew night to a large house which was built of crystals, and the walls of the house were like a tessellated floor of crystals, and its groundwork was of crystal. Its ceiling was like the path of the stars, and the lightnings in between them were 
fiery cherubim, and their heaven was as clear as water. A flaming fire surrounded the walls, and its portals blazed with fire. And I entered into that house, and it was hot as fire and cold as ice. There were no delights of life therein. Fear covered me, and trembling got a hold upon me. And as I quake and trembled, I fell upon my face. End quote. The authors, Knight and Lomas, were quoting from the book of Enoch there. That was Enoch's description of visiting what we call Newgrange. I'll continue reading in my book. Knight and Lomas have calculated by Enoch's own description that where he journeyed to see the workings of the mysterious watchers is Newgrange. From the crystal shining like fire to the tessellated floor to the description of coldness, the authors argue that Enoch visited Newgrange during the winter solstice. This is interesting for the hypothesis of this book for some very specific reasons. The Watchers are associated with arcane knowledge, being the measurers of the dimensions of the earth, being of the race of beings from the sky who are taken as gods, and also because a number of them defied their orders and taught various technologies and arts to humans and reportedly interbred with human earth women, resulting in progeny of larger than normal human stature. Where have we heard this before? The legends of Latin America, specifically Quetzalcoatl and Viracocha, both of whom came from another land and taught the natives advanced knowledge to propel their civilization forward. There are also stories of giants in Patagonia. If these legends are inspired by ancient pre-Columbian colonist explorers of other continents, there was likely some interbreeding going on as well, once they arrived and found a suitable abundance of willing partners. The female of our species does tend to be drawn toward the bigger, better deal, and such mysterious strangers from far-off advanced civilizations would have been the perceived alpha males of those days. The British Influence Newgrange was known as a mound until 1699 when a local farmer who needed stones ordered it dug into and the workers discovered the chambers and other features within. These features must have certainly reinforced the centuries of lore associated with the site, serving to further its mystique and engage the imaginations and curiosity of men who suspected that some advanced civilization had been lost to time, a civilization whose technology would indeed have been like magic to the folklorists. We will be discussing those men of curiosity soon enough, for they do factor in this investigation, but let's glance at yet another mysterious ancient feature that ties this lost civilization to the British Isles and moved these men to the action discussed in later chapters the Irish Round Towers. In my previously mentioned book, Empire of the Wheel 3, The Nameless Ones, I discuss the Round Towers, which have been associated with various ancient cultures and legends, including the Tuatha Dé Danann and even Atlantis. These stone towers are supposed to be built upon points of energy in the world grid from which they draw power. The exact use which is an unanswered question. Whatever the answer may be, these towers have certainly inspired belief in them as evidence of a lost technology of very high antiquity. Henry O'Brien, the author of The Round Towers of Atlantis, explored various such possibilities, including an ancient East Indian race as being the Tuatha, whom he argues, due to the serpent symbolism, were the so-called snakes who were run out of Ireland thus inspiring the legend of St. Patrick. This is quite interesting, for we have already discussed an ancient Hindu scripture describing in technical detail the flying machines of very remote antiquity. Now, here we have reason to suspect an ancient East Indian linked to Ireland. Imagine what the men curious about such ancient technology mysteries evident in Britain must have thought of this. Could it be part of the real reason England went to India? The point of discussing these three sites and considering any such site in the British Isles or anywhere is that something strange is going on. 
Evidence is piling up to suggest that human history is not what we're traditionally taught. In spite of the alleged linear development of civilization, it appears there might have already come and gone an advanced civilization now forgotten to us. Much has been written about this idea, so fortunately, we don't have to restate it here. And my readers know that I won't do their homework for them. I will go back to Knight and Butler because they pose the question well. Quoting, Could some other unknown group have developed the principles we see in use and then taught them to these fledgling creature cultures? Is mankind's leap across the Great Wall of History due to some superculture that has left no other trace of itself? For the first time, we begin to theorize about the strange possibility of a group whose existence can only be deduced by the knowledge they left behind. End quote. British scholars must think so too, for in 1910, Oxford professor Frederick Soddy said, quoting, some of the beliefs and legends bequeathed to us by antiquity are so universally and firmly established that we have become accustomed to consider them as being almost as ancient as humanity itself. Nevertheless, we are tempted to inquire how far the fact that some of those beliefs and legends have so many features in common is due to chance, and whether the similarity between them may not point to the existence of an ancient, totally unknown and unsuspected civilization of which all other traces have disappeared. End quote. So here we have established that evidence to argue for a lost technology of a forgotten civilization, hinted at mostly in folklore, has captured the attention of scholars in England, likely because so much of this evidence can be found in the British Isles. It is important to note that it doesn't matter what one thinks of this evidence or the idea of its source as discussed. The point of this investigation is to explore what motivated the expedition that left one of the world's greatest and toughest explorers in an alleged state of silent and drunken exhaustion. Megalithic structures and other evidence of lost knowledge can be found all over the world, but nowhere is it more clear and abundant than in South America. Present-day proponents of the idea of the lost civilization have taken notice of this as they inspect and analyze the ruins of now familiar places such as Cusco, Machu Picchu, and Tiahuanaco. But it was not so long ago that these places were either unknown or less was known about them than we can surmise today. There was a time when all of this represented a mystery as fantastic as Atlantis. Atlantis has been in the popular public psyche for well over a century, and its legend has been around for thousands of years. I doubt that anyone reading this book has heard of, hasn't heard of Atlantis. It presently stands to conceptually represent any lost civilization for most people. Searching for lost Atlantis isn't just the passionate hobby of weird history nerds, for there was a time when it occupied the serious attention of men of scientific inquiry. The historical search for Atlantis is what led these men to South America in the first place. Consider Olaf Rudbeck, a brilliant 17th century medical student whose ultimate passion became his theory that Atlantis was actually to be found in Scandinavia, Rudbeck has essentially been forgotten today. However, he was once a star. The author of Finding Atlantis, A True Story of Genius Madness and an Extraordinary Quest for a Lost World, David King, writes this of Rudbeck, quoting, Olaf Rudbeck once cast a spell over his contemporaries. Rudbeck was greatly admired at the court of Louis XIV, proposed as a member of the Royal Society in London, and celebrated in cafes, salons, and academies. Avid readers were Leibniz, Montesquieu, and the famous skeptic Pierre Bale. Even Sir Isaac Newton wrote to request a personal copy of the work. End quote. That work was Atlantica, published by the Uppsala Press in 1679, a multiple volume wonder book which, as David King puts it, revolutionized the understanding of the ancient past. As Rudbeck's discoveries piled up, disgruntled colleagues attempted to sabotage his efforts. 
King writes, and I'm quoting, from Mount Olympus to Valhalla, Rudbeck traced almost all Greek, Norse, and Egyptian traditions back to an original home in the far north, end quote. King calls Rudbeck the first of the modern hunters for lost wisdom. In spite of the treasures being brought back from the New World, specifically the volumes of gold and the discovery of Andean mines, not to mention the curious ruins which the natives even identified as a great mystery of a race predating themselves, Rudbeck still insisted on a northern setting for Atlantis. However, partly thanks to chroniclers such as Francisco Lopez de Gomorra in 1553 AD, the idea that the lost civilization's capital was to be found in the Americas grew in popularity among the men seeking it. With the popularity of Atlantica came high praise for Rudbeck. This is a particular interest to our story here, for as David King points out, the interest in Atlantis and lost civilization among British thinkers was enthusiastic. Quoting, with Christopher Wren in the presidential chair, the Royal Society sent Rudbeck the following words, We are not able to admire enough the power of genius and the abundance of learning by which you uncover the secrets of the past. End quote. According to the records of the Royal Society, Olaf Rudbeck's theories on Atlantis were the subject of their gathered discussions three times in late 1681. In December of that year, Rudbeck was proposed for membership of the Royal Society by Cambridge University Regis Professor of Greek, Thomas Gale, and it was seconded by none other than Robert Hooke. According to King, Rudbeck wasn't interested. But apparently the Royal Society was interested, and that meant that the greatest minds in Britain and the world were also interested in the idea of a lost Atlantis somewhere out there. With the opening of the New World and the stream of wonders and riches flooding in from South America and New Spain, it looked to these men like they might indeed have found their lost civilization. The fact is, there would come reason to believe it so, and that reason would ultimately send a great explorer on the most revealing and harrowing adventure of his life. There is enough written elsewhere, including King's book on Rudbeck, for the reader to explore the historical trail of interest in locating the lost civilization, especially the search for Atlantis. Suffice it to say here that with the opening of the New World came an intensifying of that search. The New World made believers out of great minds of science and historical inquiry. During the span of the late 15th to the mid-19th centuries, the stage was being set for what many considered inevitable. The discovery of evidence that there once existed on this planet a civilization possessing advanced technology and scientific knowledge surpassing even that of the approaching 20th century. It was this belief that resulted in what I am convinced was a covert expedition to investigate the specific report of a city which the authorities involved suspected was at last the proof that a now forgotten civilization had indeed existed in the Americas and around the world. This was not merely an unknown native village, nor simply crumbling exaggerated ruins. This was the report of a city of extraordinary architecture, amid a milieu of astonishing tales of artificial lights, of an unknown written language, and of enigmatic statuary, of miles of man-made tunnels and endless supplies of gold and silver and other mineral riches and of haunted halls and strange foundations hinting at machinery long lost to time. It was what they had been waiting for and there was at the time only one man to investigate. Captain Richard Francis Burton. Thus do I propose the following. Burton was sent to South America as an agent of some group covertly embedded within the Royal Society on behalf of British intelligence. Point one, Burton's mission in South America was to investigate two specific locations associated with a lost civilization. Point two, Burton's reports remain classified to this day. Point three, Burton's secret mission to South America led directly to the expedition and disappearance 
of Colonel Percy Fawcett. Yes, this is a book of speculations, big ones. But well before you reach the final page, you will have learned that there is enough upon which to hang these speculations to make them worthwhile. Before we address these bold assertions, let's find out why someone within the Royal Society would have been behind such an expedition and why Richard Francis Burton was the man whom they sent. And that, dear listener, is merely the prologue to my book and this discussion on the lost expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton. And I will be returning to dive deeper into this work. And um, I hope that it sparks your interest in this mystery of Burton. I hope it interests you in reading the book as well. You can get it print on demand at Lulu. Um, even though I'm going to be reading big chunks of it here, there's nothing like having, you know, a book in hand. Um, so I do hope you consider that. And if you have the book already, you can read along with me. So um, I will at some point possibly be jumping over into um, Secret Missions 5, Veiled Destinies, where it pertains to um, the Burton research, um, specifically where uh, secret. By the time I got to Secret Missions 5, I was further enlightened on the um, subjects and questions and speculations that I present in the Burton book. So um, it's just as much a learning process for me as it is for you. But um, this, this Secret Missions series, um, the, the subjects, the individuals, all the things in these books, which again are up to five, um, with a second volume on the esoteric Napoleon coming soon. These things fascinate me. Um, it really um, has been among the most fascinating subjects in my life that I've ever, ever researched, so... Um, I will just keep going on them. So I hope you enjoyed this this introductory uh, little uh, episode in this discussion on the Lost Expedition of Sir Richard Francis Burton, and I'll be back next time with Chapter 1. And this has been Walter Bosley, 